All right, so we're just going to give it a few more seconds. Okay, it looks like um, 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 people are still filing in, but we're going to get started anyway. So hi, everyone, and thank you for attending and via Fertility's patient education webinar on recurrent pregnancy loss. My name is Vicki, and I will be your moderator for this informational session. I'm honored to present to you the speaker of our webinar, Dr. Vishwanath Karande. Dr. Karande completed his residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the State University of New York at Buffalo, and he completed a fellowship in the subspecialty of reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the prestigious Jones Institute for Reproductive Medicine at the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Envia Fertility has three physicians in total, um, Dr. Pushek, Dr. Karande, and Dr. Klipstein. All three of these physicians are board certified in the specialty of obstetrics and gynecology and the subspecialty of reproductive endocrinology and infertility. We also have four locations for the convenience of our patients. Our main office is Hoffman Estates. This is where our surgical suite and embryology lab are located. We have satellite offices in Arlington Heights, Crystal Lake, and Northbrook. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A section, and we will have time at the end for a question and answer segment with Dr. Karande. Uh, now I'm gonna hand over our talk to Dr. Karande to talk all about recurrent pregnancy loss. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for joining us today where we are going to be speaking on a topic I am very passionate about. This is so because it's very common and it affects everybody. To give you an example, here's Carrie Underwood on repeated miscarriages. She says, why on earth do I keep getting pregnant if I can't have a kid? Like, what is this? Either shut the door or let me have a kid. Or Leela Rochon says, I think you never truly get over that kind of loss and you never trust your body again until you see a healthy child come. So next slide. What I'm gonna to do today is present a summary of uh, the three most recent international evidence-based guidelines on recurrent pregnancy loss. At the same time, uh, describe to you what we do with our recurrent pregnancy loss patients at Invia Fertility. I'll be talking about the different causes of recurrent pregnancy loss, the tests that we do, and then finally, we'll be talking about how we treat recurrent pregnancy loss. Next slide. So when somebody is having recurrent miscarriages, a very relevant question is, what are my chances of having a baby? And please follow this slide because the information here is very important. What they did is they looked at women who have had at least one live birth after first consultation by the number of miscarriages before the first consultation. So the first graph is with three miscarriages, then four, five, and finally six. So when these patients were followed for five and 10 years, they eventually did have a live birth. Now, when I speak to my patients, nobody wants to wait that long to have a baby. So when we treat patients with recurrent miscarriages, the goals are twofold. Number one is to minimize the risk of a repeated miscarriage. Each one of these miscarriages is emotionally very devastating and hasten the time to pregnancy. And that is what I'm gonna summarize in our talk today. Next. So what is recurrent pregnancy loss? Till very recently, we used to wait for patients to have three miscarriages before we started doing tests. In fact, in Europe, they do not do testing for recurrent pregnancy loss till there's a third loss. But in the US, generally speaking, we have been doing testing uh, after the second loss. So 
A pregnancy loss is defined as a loss of a pregnancy prior to 24 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, and the debate between two and three were, was resolved when they found that there was an insignificant change in positive investigation results between two and three pregnancy losses. So currently after the second loss, we do these tests. Next slide. So does age have an impact on the incidence of recurrent pregnancy loss? And the answer is yes. Especially if you look at patients after age 40, the rate of pregnancy loss is almost 50%. And a lot of these pregnancy losses are because of chromosomal abnormality in the pregnancy. And we will be discussing that further details uh, in a few slides. So in young patients, the rate of pregnancy loss is close to 11%. And then as you can see, as the age increases, the rate of pregnancy loss increases. 5% of couples will have two losses and 1% of couples will have three or more. Next. So what are the causes of recurrent pregnancy loss? And here's a whole list. Uh, it could be hormonal, it could be anatomic, there could be congenital anomalies, scar tissue in the uterus, immunological causes, genetic infections, environmental lifestyle, and to some extent, a male, the male partner could contribute towards miscarriages. In about half the patients, we do not have, I mean, all the tests will come back negative. And in that case, we use a diagnosis of what's called as recurrent aneuploidy. And I will be discussing management of patients where all the tests have come back negative and they're still miscarrying a little bit later during my talk. Next. So when we talk about anatomic causes, a very common cause of miscarriages is, is fibroids. These are usually benign tumors and Almost 20% of women have fibroids. So the two things that are relevant is the size of the fibroid and the location. In the middle of the picture, you're seeing the fibroids with the numbers on them. So fibroid number zero, one, two, and even two to five are impinging on the uterine cavity. It is generally accepted that if a fibroid is distorting the uterine cavity, it should be removed. Also, if a fibroid is greater than five centimeters in diameter, that's another indication to remove the fibroid. Now, when it comes to diagnosing fibroids, we can either do that by ultrasound or by X-ray. And what you're seeing on the right side is an image of what is called as a hysterosonogram, where what we have done is with a little catheter injected saline into the uterine cavity while scanning using a vaginal ultrasound. And as you can see, there's that fibroid that is bulging into the uterine cavity. That same fibroid is now being shown in the image on the left side where we are doing a hysteroscopy. Where what we do under anesthesia is use a fiber optic telescope where, which is inserted through the cervix into the uterus which is distended with saline. And when you look at inside with a camera, there is the fibroid uh, that could be causing recurrent miscarriages. So removal of the fibroids can be done with different techniques. Uh, depending upon the preference of the surgeon, the technique of choice can be used. And there is no real, no real evidence suggesting that one technique is necessarily better than the other. Next slide. Uterine anomalies can cause miscarriages and what you're seeing on the left side is a normal uterus followed by a uterus with what is called as a uterine septum. You can see there's a septum that's coming down from the top of the uterus towards the cervix dividing the uterine cavity into two. Now this septum is usually does not have blood supply. So when a woman conceives and if the pregnancy implants on the septum with inadequate blood flow, 
miscarriage results. Now, this second picture is showing a hysterosalpingogram, that is an X-ray, where we are injecting radiopaque dye through the cervix into the uterine cavity, and you can once again see what could be a uterine septum. The third image is so showing a uterine septum on ultrasound, where once again a hysterosonogram is being done, and saline is being injected in the uterine cavity. And when on ultrasound you look at it, you see those two uh, circles with a area in the middle, which is the uterine septum. The same septum, when you look at it through a hysteroscope, and remember this is a fiber optic telescope, which goes through the cervix into the uterine cavity. The uterus is distended with saline and there is the septum uh, uh, visible on hysteroscopy. It's a fairly simple in-office procedure to use a scissors and then cut through the uterine septum till it is completely removed. It's something which we do routinely at India and it takes about 15 minutes for the actual procedure. Uh, it's an outpatient procedure and there's immediate recovery. Now, if you look at the picture in the middle with the X-ray, with an X-ray, it is not possible to differentiate between a uterine septum and a double uterus. A double uterus is also called as a bicornuate uterus. And we are gonna to go to the next slide, which shows 3D ultrasound imaging where what you're seeing in image A is a normal uterine cavity. Image B is showing a T-shaped uterus. Image C is showing a partial uterine septum. The reason why this is a uterine septum is if you look at the top of the uterus, it is bulging outwards. It's a single uterus, which is divided into two by the septum. Image four is showing a complete uterine septum, which is coming all the way down to the cervix. And image E is showing what is called as a double uterus or a bicornuate uterus. Bicornuate uterus, generally speaking, are not operated upon. And whether or not they result in recurrent miscarriages is some, still something that is being debated. In image F and G, you're seeing a patient with what is called as a unicornuate uterus, where there's only one half of the uterus present. Once again, whether or not a unicornuate uterus causes miscarriages is debated, but everybody agrees that with only half a uterus present, there's an increased risk of premature delivery and malpresentation of the baby. Next slide. Another common cause, uh, anatomical cause of recurrent miscarriages is scar tissue inside the uterus. And this quite often happens because of previous surgery. For example, if a DNC has been done to uh, evacuate the uterus after a miscarriage, there are some women who will form scar tissue and this can happen even when the DNC is done with the appropriate technique in the hands of experienced surgeon. Uh, you can see on the left hand side is a hysterosalpingogram where we have injected radio opaque dye through the cervix. And instead of seeing a beautiful triangular uterus, you're seeing these filling defects, which are scar tissue. The same scar tissue is now shown on the right side via hysteroscopy and the X's are marking the bands of scar tissue that are coming from the anterior to the posterior wall of the uterus. Uh, these can very easily be cut using a scissors and there are other electrical and ultrasound instruments or even mechanical instruments that can be used to cut the scar tissue. In patients with severe adhesions, quite often we will build up the lining of the uterus with estrogen pills for 30 days before doing the surgery. During the hysteroscopy, we take a lot of care to make sure we don't make a hole in the uterus. 
and after the surgery we will quite often insert a balloon catheter into the uterus to prevent the two surfaces come coming close to each other the catheter is usually removed after 3 or 7 days and post operatively the patient is treated with estrogen tablets for 60 days and we have had very good techniques using this uh, protocol next immunological causes of infertility now depending upon which paper you read the incidence can be in the single digits or sometimes even as high as 40% um uh, immunological causes of recurrent miscarriages can happen in early pregnancy or it can happen even later on in pregnancy so there was a committee which got together and then came with criteria for diagnosis of what is called as anti phospholipid antibody syndrome or an aps now the clinical criteria for diagnosing aps is if there's a history of blood clots or when it comes to pregnancy if there have been three or more unexplained consecutive spontaneous miscarriages before 10 weeks of pregnancy or one uh, miscarriage after 10 weeks of a morphologically normal pregnancy or if there's a premature birth of a morphologically normal baby before 34 weeks of pregnancy because of eclampsia or severe preeclampsia or if there are recognized features that the placenta is not working properly so these are the patients with this kind of a history that we do tests to see if the immune system is causing these miscarriages the mechanism as to how this immune system causes miscarriages is again controversial but basically it interferes with how the pregnancy implants into the uterus then it also leads to the activation of what's called the complement system all of these factors combined together with microscopic blood clots forming at the level of the pregnancy resulting in miscarriage so the treatment of this quite often is blood thinners and we'll talk about it when i talk about how we manage patients with recurrent pregnancy loss when it comes to diagnosing anti phospholipid syndrome there are strict laboratory criteria uh, that have been defined and the three that are used are lupus anticoagulant anti cardiolipin antibody and anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibody now these three tests if even one of them is abnormal then they have to be repeated 12 weeks later and if the same abnormality persists then a diagnosis of anti phospholipid syndrome is made next now there is there are further tests that are called thrombophilia panel uh, that have been suggested and the american society for reproductive medicine has come with a recommendation that these tests should not be done routinely they can be done only if as a part of a research protocol or if there is a history of blood clots either in the patient or a strong family history of blood clots these tests are enumerated in this slide and i'm not going to read the slide next slide what about other hormonal causes if you have severe uncontrolled thyroid that can cause miscarriages so if your blood sugar levels are uncontrolled that can cause miscarriages there's a hormone called prolactin if that is elevated it can interfere with the growth of follicles the quality of ovulation it can cause what's called as a luteal phase defect and all of these could contribute to miscarriages there's a very simple pill called bromocriptin another one called cabergoline which are used to correct hyperprolactinemia 
progesterone deficiency as a cause of recurrent miscarriages is controversial. I did my fellowship with Dr. Georgiana Jones, and she was the one who in 1949 defined what is called as a luteal phase defect, where early pregnancy low, uh, with low progesterone levels resulted in miscarriages, and the treatment was to treat with progesterone. To this day, I think a lot of OBGYNs and infertility specialists routinely are giving progesterone to their uh, recurrent pregnancy loss uh, patients. Now, there have been randomized controlled trials that have looked as to whether the use of progesterone in early pregnancy prevents miscarriage, and a lot of them fail to demonstrate a benefit. One of the good studies, though, showed that in women with three or more consecutive miscarriages immediately prior to the current pregnancy, progesterone may help. At Invia, we will quite often start progesterone, and these days we have vaginal tablets or a vaginal gel that can be used uh, two or three days after ovulation, meaning we start the progesterone even before the woman has missed her a period and has had a positive pregnancy test. Uh, it, and uh, this has turned to be quite useful. Next. Infections. Several infections that have been looked at are enumerated in this slide. Urea plasma, ureliticum, it goes on, the list goes on and on and on. There is no convincing data that infections cause recurrent pregnancy loss. And the general consensus was that giving antibiotics to patients with recurrent miscarriages was not indicated. However, next slide, please. There was this paper that came from a group of very reputed investigators at the University of Illinois. And what they did was looked at about 400 women with a history of two, more, two or more pregnancy losses. And they did what's called as an endometrial biopsy, where with a small catheter, they sampled the lining of the uterus and checked for inflammation. In patients with chronic endometritis, that is inflammation, they treated them with antibiotics for two weeks and the antibiotics, there was a 100% cure of the endometritis and the subsequent live birth rate was very encouraging, which is why now for the last year or so, we have been giving antibiotics to our recurrent pregnancy loss patients for two weeks. Uh, we are looking for more follow-up studies to confirm this uh, observation. Next. What are the genetic causes? I mean, a very common cause is what is called as a balanced translocation. Uh, this affects two to 5% of couples with uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. And what happens in a, in a translocation is a part of one chromosome is swapped or attached to another chromosome. In a balanced translocation, which is shown in this slide, there isn't any lost or extra information. All the parts of the original two chromosomes are there with the usual number of copies, and the person is perfectly normal, except when they are trying to achieve a pregnancy, this kind of a balanced translocation results in abnormal uh, chromosomes in the baby, resulting in miscarriages. Next. So I had mentioned recurrent aneuploidy. And as I said, in about half the patients with recurrent pregnancy loss, all the tests come back negative. In those patients, we presume that the reason why they are miscarrying is that the pregnancy is chromosomally abnormal. And that's why mother nature is not letting that pregnancy progress. So what can be done 
in patients with recurrent aneuploidy. One option, of course, is to just tell the couple to keep trying and eventually there will be a live birth. But to these patients, another pregnancy, another miscarriage can be emotionally very challenging. So one of the things we have been doing is in vitro fertilization, where we screen embryos for chromosomal abnormality prior to transfer. The pregnancy rates have been improving. The techniques for doing the biopsy has been, have been improving. And now there's next generation sequencing for chromosomal testing that is very, very accurate. And uh, the results are encouraging. Next slide. So to explain things as to how we sample embryos, I'm going to talk you through this slide. What you're seeing in the first image on day one is a fertilized egg, which then divides. The next image is showing a two cell. Then on day two, you have a four cell. On day three, you have an eight cell embryo. And five days after egg retrieval, you have what is called as a blastocyst. This is an advanced embryo. And by looking at this embryo, we cannot tell you whether it's chromosomally normal or abnormal. So what we do is what's called as an embryo biopsy, where with a laser, we make a little slit in the eggshell. Next slide. And we take a small portion of the outer cell mass, which forms placenta. We do not touch the part of the embryo that results in baby. So we do what's called as an embryo biopsy and then freeze the embryo. Those cells are then test, sent for testing where we get results on all 23 chromosomes, including X and Y. Subsequently, when we do a frozen embryo transfer of a euploid, meaning chromosomally normal embryo, the incidence of a repeat miscarriage, which can be 30 to 50%, goes down to about 8%. Next. What about male factor and recurrent pregnancy loss? A semen analysis by itself does not predict uh, chances of miscarriage. However, there is a special test it's called as a sperm chromatin structural assay or SCSA, with which we look for sperm DNA fragmentation. This is a specialized test where we freeze the husband's semen sample and ship it to a lab which then tells whether or not the fragmentation index is normal or abnormal. The treatment is lifestyle factors, weight loss, stop smoking, reduction of alcohol intake, taking prenatal, uh, taking vitamins, taking uh, uh, antioxidants like CoQ10, vitamin C. These are all steps that can improve the functional status of sperm. Next. So what happens when a, pa a patient has recurrent pregnancy loss? What do we do? So after second pregnancy loss, it's reasonable to do some testing. Of course, the lifestyle management is very important as well. And these are things which as patients, you can take responsibility for. But when it comes to testing for the male, we could check for DNA fragmentation. In the female, we would check hormone tests, ultrasounds, do a histrosonogram or a histrosalpingogram, do immune tests. If there is a miscarriage, then it is very helpful to send the products of conception for chromosomal testing. Because if the chromosomes come abnormal, then at least we have an explanation to the couple as to why uh, the miscarriage happened. Uh, generally speaking, at this stage, the patients will be referred to a specialized clinic like Invia. So what do we do at Invia? Next slide. So this is a little busy slide, but let me talk you through them to, to it. If you have antiphospholipid antibody, which are persistent, then the patient will benefit from low dose aspirin and a blood thinner. You can either use heparin or there's another medicine called as Lovenox. 
these are started as soon as the pr pr pregnancy test is positive and sometimes continue throughout pregnancy. Thyroid abnormalities are easy to fix. It's a tablet called levothyroxine, which will take care of uh, hypothyroidism. Uterine abnormalities can quite often be corrected surgically. In couples where one of the partners has a balanced translocation, we recommend genetic counseling. Uh, they have the option of either continuing to try on their own, or we talk about prenatal genetic testing along with in vitro fertilization. Uh, for sperm DNA fragmentation abnormalities, improvement of lifestyle will help. In patients with a history of blood clots, it's reasonable to screen for uh, hereditary thrombophilias. But there are a lot of other tests which I have not mentioned. I mean, natural killer cells, and it goes on and on and on. Those tests really are not recommended. Next. So one of the things which my teacher, Dr. Howard Jones, would tell me is uh, assisted reproductive technologies have improved to a point where if you are persistent and you continue with treatment, there's a very, very good chance that you will have a live birth. You have to be willing to make certain adjustments, for example, using donor gametes or even using a gestational carrier. But if you persist, then you will have a live birth. So in conclusion, recurrent pregnancy loss is defined as two or more pregnancy losses. It affects less than 5% of couples. We at Invia specialize in taking care of uh, patients with pregnancy loss. It's not just the medical management, but the tender loving cares, emotional support. These are the things which we pride, uh, we take great pride in how we serve our patients at Invia. A thorough workup and correction of any abnormality will improve outcome. In about half of the patients, we will not find any abnormality. The prognosis for these couples is good and in vitro fertilization with testing of the embryos for chromosomal abnormalities may help. So at this point, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, Dr. Krande, you actually covered a lot of the pre-submitted questions in your talk. You did a really good job. So I'm gonna go over some um, and see if maybe um, you can help patients out with this. So the first one is, are chemical pregnancies considered miscarriages? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Sure, are chemical pregnancies considered miscarriages? That's a controversial issue. I've spoken to many of my colleagues and very respected colleagues and we do treat, uh, at NVIA we do consider biochemical pregnancies to be a uh, part of, uh, when you're counting pregnancy losses, we do count biochemical pregnancies as real pregnancies. I think okay. even the oh, European I Society has now, uh, when you talk about a miscarriage, if there's been a positive pregnancy test, then that is the definition of a uh, miscarriage. Okay, another one is, how long would you recommend waiting after a loss before trying again? It would depend upon what is causing the loss and what abnormality has been found and what has been tested. To give you an example, if you have a patient with a fibroid, once the fibroid is removed and we have made sure the uterus has healed normally, then the couple could try conception in the following month itself. Versus somebody else who's had scar tissue for which we have had to put the balloon catheter into the uterus and uh, 60 days of estrogen, then it may have to, they may have to wait a couple of months before they are able to try getting pregnant again. Uh, 
generally speaking, it takes six to eight weeks for the body to return back to the non-pregnant state from a miscarriage. So for a lot of patients at that point, it's reasonable to try again. Okay. Um, how many losses would you consider to be um, an amount before you would suggest surrogacy? That is a very good question. And uh, gestational carriers are generally recommended to couples where we have found no cause for the miscarriage and they're continuing to miscarry even when we have transferred chromosomally normal embryos. Uh, as to the number of miscarriages, that depends upon the patient's emotional status. Some patients after two or three miscarriages are simply not ready to get pregnant again because they're terrified about the prospect of another miscarriage. Uh, gestational carriers, however, I mean, two things. One is in Illinois here, we are very fortunate where the laws are very favorable. If you go to a reproductive lawyer and get the proper paperwork done, then when the gestational carrier delivers the baby, the birth certificate will have the names of the genetic parents. So from that perspective, Illinois is a very good place to pursue genetic uh, counseling, uh, sorry, uh, gestational carrier. However, it's expensive. And uh, especially if you are going to use a gestational ca carrier provided by an agency, uh, it is a very expensive proposition. Um. So we've had a couple questions come in um, saying that, you know, you had mentioned tests weren't recommended and they're wondering why they're not. Oh, because they have not been found to be useful. Uh, you're talking about the immune tests, I presume, uh, and also the thrombophilia panels. Uh, what's been shown is they have not been very useful in terms of helping with either diagnosing the cause or treating them as not resulted in favorable outcomes. Okay. Um, we had a couple questions. Um, I'm hoping you can explain. I don't know the difference um, between intralipid infusion and platelet rich plasma therapy. Are these services we do or you would recommend or what are your thoughts? I guess you're referring to intralipids. These are uh, lipid solutions which are used when you need to feed somebody parently. They are supposed to activate the immune system and prevent miscarriages. So uh, unfortunately, the studies where they have done prospective randomized studies where they use the placebo versus the intralipids, the intralipids have not worked. Uh, there has also been a lot of literature where natural killer cell levels have been checked and patients with abnormal natural killer cells have been treated with intravenous gamma globulin, IVIG. The American Congress of OBGYN has actually come with a statement saying that this should not be a, a, a part of routine management of recurrent pregnancy loss. It does not work. It can be used, however, as part of a research study only. Okay, last question. Um, is there a recommended amount of losses before you would counsel a patient to do PGT or after a certain age, should that be considered standard of care? Um, Recurrent pregnancy loss with two or three miscarriages when they come to see us, we do the workup. In about half the patients, the workup will be completely negative. At that time, they are offered the option of either trying on their own or with a diagnosis of recurrent aneuploidy, we would go and do in vitro fertilization and screen the embryos and transfer them 
uh, transfer only normal embryos. The problem with patients who are 40 and above is that they produce very few eggs. And to do in vitro fertilization and then screen the embryos for abnormality is a further challenge because between 70 to 100% of the embryos will be chromosomally abnormal. So quite often in patients above age 40, they may have to do more than one IVF cycle before we get that one normal embryo. And even that will have an implantation rate of about 50 to 60% and an 8% chance of miscarriage, even though it's chromosomally normal. All right, that wraps it up. Um, we still have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna ask everyone that submitted questions that we didn't have time to get to, to please submit them to info at nviafertility.com so we can um, respond to you, or of course, feel free to call our office and schedule a consult with one of our physicians. So thank you so much for attending this webinar. Thank you also to Dr. Karande for sharing this information with us. Please check our website at nviafertility.com for dates of future webinars, as well as recordings of our previous ones. Please also follow us on Facebook and Instagram for updates about our practice. Um, like I said, submit any of the questions that you have to info, I-N-F-O, at nviafertility.com and stay safe and healthy.